we are so glad to um, see you yet again um, on our God and Science Week. Today, I have um, uh, Professor John Walton with us, and he will be sharing with us the flood and compact time. I'm telling you, I'm enjoying this, and I'm sitting in the comfort of my own home. So it'd be very interesting to see where you are today. Instead of telling me that you are from a particular country, just tell me whether you're in a classroom, in your living room, in the garden, what the weather is like. We just want to know a little bit about our, our audience today. Humor us, please. It'll be interesting to see what you are doing while you are listening or, um, to Professor Walton. Um, what I would like to remind you of, of course, is if you have any questions, and it doesn't matter if it's related to tonight's um, lecture, if it's related to yesterday and the day before, previous lectures that have been done, please get them in to us. Please get them in by, via our website, www.godandscience.co.uk, Facebook, and also our YouTube page. Thank you so much. I would like to welcome to you John Walton this afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Greetings from St Andrews. Welcome to this fourth in the series of The God and Science online series. I'm speaking to you from my office at home here in St Andrews. And it's a bit of a new experience for me speaking just looking into a blank screen with no feedback from the audience. It feels a bit strange and it feels a bit dead. So if there are a few glitches, um, if there are a few awkward moments, um, I hope you'll make allowances for them. We're trying to tackle some of the most intriguing, some of the most vexed subjects in this God and Science series. To what or to whom do we owe our existence? Where did we come from? How did the world come into existence? How long ago? Everything of importance seems to be riding on answers to these kind of questions. And it's difficult to rest without the answers because our personal belief systems depend on them. Our hopes, our aspirations, our expectations of life, how we lead our lives. You know, there's a story going around about a little girl and she asked her mother, where do people come from? And her mother told her, well, God made Adam and Eve and they got married and had children and more children came, and that's how uh, the world was populated. That's where we came from. Uh, a day or two later, <clears throat> she asked her father the same question, and he said, well, a long time ago, there were some apes, and we evolved from those apes. Well, the little girl was puzzled, so she went back to her mother, and she said, Mom, how come you told me God made us, but Dad said we come from apes? Her mother said, well, it's very simple, dear. I told you about my side of the family and your father told you about his side of the family. Now, I don't know what you make of that story, but it's a fact that we do have to make up our minds. Do we come from Eden or do we come from the apes? It's necessary to understand something about our origins. You know, evidence favoring creation favoring um, design, favoring a short history for the world, has been piling up in recent times. There's an awful lot to tell you, so let's get started. There are two basic chronological systems for the Earth. The first of these is called deep time. The idea that Earth history has carried on for billions of years. The world contains thousands of distinct life forms, so evolution needs a vast number of changes to account for their origins. Favorable mutations are rare. Each modification has to be favored by natural selection. Each has to be passed to offspring. 
and each has to spread to the whole population. So billions of years are needed between the first appearance of life on Earth and the present day. So deep time is essential for molecules to man evolution. The alternative is compact time, the idea that Earth history extends back only six or 7,000 years. Now this compact time is fatal for molecules to man evolution. With deep time, there are serious implications for scripture. The creation account in Genesis would be unhistorical and it would be misleading. Life would have originated long before 7,000 years ago. Homo sapiens emerged hundreds of thousands of years ago, so all human beings couldn't be descended from one pair, Adam and Eve. Death didn't originate in Eden, was not the result of sin. Death has been an integral part of life's panorama for long ages with deep time. Deep time necessitates then a radical reinterpretation of Genesis as allegory or metaphor or myth. Compact time, on the other hand, is essential <clears throat> to a historical understanding of Genesis. Now, in trying to decide between deep time and compact time, the global flood is a critical parameter. Was there or wasn't there a global flood? Let's concentrate to begin with and think a bit about this global flood. Looking first at the flood basics as described in the Genesis chapter six to eight. <clears throat> We're told there that God tells Noah to build a large boat. Eight persons will be on board. Representatives of all animal kinds will be on board. Then all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens are opened. All the high mountains under the entire heavens are covered. The flood lasts just over a year. Then bird scouts are sent out and then the boat lands on the mountains of Ararat. Probably not much else in scripture has received so much ridicule on the internet, particularly as uh, these chapters of Genesis. There are so many cartoons um, lampooning this description. In the 21st century, is it possible for us to really believe in a global flood? Well, I think there are many good reasons why we can, and I'll try and describe some of them this evening. So did the flood really happen? First thing to notice is that New Testament writers spoke of the flood as history. For example, Matthew 24 has Jesus saying, for as in the days that were before the flood, and so on. Luke 17 says something similar, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Luke 3 mentions Noah in a genealogy there. Hebrews 11 mentions Noah in the Faith Hall of Fame. Peter, in his epistles, mentions the flood no less than three times. He draws a parallel between the flood waters of Noah and baptism. In 2 Peter, God didn't spare the world of Noah, but sent a flood. In 2 Peter 3, he mentions the flood in the context of scoffers. So if we discount the flood, this does huge damage to the credibility of the New Testament, as well as the credibility of the Old Testament. But it's not just in the Bible that we find accounts of the flood. There's flood folklore from all around the world. There's a Norse prose edda from Snorri Sturluson. Burglemere and his wife are the sole survivors of a huge flood. Greek, there are several flood stories. Plato's Timaeus has Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha, and they escape in a boat. There are several Sanskrit man manuscripts from India. Manu and his family, or Manu and seven sages, escape in a boat. There's an Aztec account from South America. Cocox and his wife survive in a boat. In Mexico, there's a tribal story in which Zeppi escapes in a boat filled with animals. In the Middle East, in Mesopotamia, 
the flood is taken for granted by ancient civilizations. The Babylonian account has Atna Pishtim. He escapes with his family in a boat. And there's the cuneiform tablet, the Gilgamesh epic, which describes that. The Akkadian uh, account has Atrahasis as the, uh, as the hero of the account. And in the Sumerian account, it's Ziosudra who escapes in a boat. That tablet dates from 1700 BC. Those cultures take the flood for granted. There are at least half a dozen king lists, and they divide their rulers into those before the flood and those after the flood. And other literature from that era also mentions the flood, either in passing or in or references to it. But Chinese poetry also has many mentions of a great flood, and this Chinese pictograph, symbol of a boat, it's made up of three um, sections, a vessel, eight, and people, reminiscent of the Genesis account. There are more than 270 flood accounts from around the world. In Europe, Norse, Greek, Celtic, in the Near and Middle East, I've mentioned some of those. In Asia, there are Hindu, Tamil, Mongolian, Pacific Islands even, Palau, Samoa, Tahiti, Australia, Africa, South America, North America, Native Americans there. From all around the world, there are 270 at least flood accounts. Some authors put the number at over a thousand. It's one of the most common folk tales, folk legends that there are. And they have a lot of elements in common. In virtually all of them, it's God or gods who bring the flood about. 95% of them, the flood is global. 88%, a special family are saved. In 70%, they're saved in a boat. In 67%, animals are saved, and so on. They have all these elements in common. So what do we, what can we conclude from this? You know, our folklore is often the faded memory of a real event. Details may be lost, they may be obscured, but there's a kernel of truth that remains. The soundest way to understand this is that a few real people survived a real global flood on a real boat which landed on a real mountain, and their descendants now fill the globe, never to forget that real event. Could it have been just a local flood then, as critics maintain? Well, Local floods are common, and they're particularly common in Mesopotamia, where the rivers Tigris and Euphrates often flood their banks. There'd be no reason to uh, put one of these local floods into a numinous folklore account. Then there'd be no need for a boat. People could just migrate and save all the effort of, of building this enormous structure. There'd certainly be no need to save animals and wild animals if it was just a local flood. And then think about birds. Many of the uh, flood folklore mention birds. There'd be absolutely no point in saving birds on a boat. They could simply fly to the nearest piece of dry ground and perch there until it died away. Then the language of Genesis and other folklore, not just Genesis, simply isn't consistent with a local flood. If mountains were covered, then the water was much too deep for a local flood. Now, sometimes mountains is translated hills, but if hills were covered, it's still too um, it's still too deep. Then only eight people being saved. Many more than eight people are saved in local floods. Then think of the rainbow promise in Genesis. God promises not to send another such flood. Well, if it's a local flood. There have been hundreds, thousands of local floods since then, so the promise would have been broken many times and it would be absolutely meaningless. A local flood just doesn't make sense in the light of Genesis or any of the other folklore. So when did this flood take place then? If um, the flood took place 
all the vegetation on the surface of the earth would have been destroyed during the flood. But when the waters receded, it would soon start to seed again. And in particular, the trees would start growing again. Now, trees are particularly significant because they can be dated from the uh, count of their rings. You can count their rings and get an independent way of dating them. So what are the oldest trees that we know on the surface of the earth? They should give us an idea of when the flood might have taken place. Well, there are the giant sequoias. Some of those are more than 3,000 years old. There are cypresses in Patagonia, more than three and a half thousand years old. There's a tree, a yew tree in Llangonu in Wales that's more than 4,000 years old. But the oldest trees in the world are the bristlecone pines, which um, live to more than 5,000 years, some of them. There's one with a ring count of 5,069 years. That tallies reasonably well with the date for the flood that's uh, computed from the folklore, from the Genesis account and also from the Babylonian and um, Chinese accounts. Very roughly, they give a date of round about that time, 5,000 years ago. In um, the Genesis account, Noah is said to be 600 years old at the time of the flood. Is it possible that somebody could really live, a human being, to 6,000 years? We don't really know, you know, science doesn't really know why people die when they do. Why do our cells, after about 70 years, start giving up and not reproducing themselves, not re replenishing themselves? There's various theories of aging. There's the free radical theory of aging, which is of interest to me since that's my speciality. The idea being that free radicals do irreversible damage, and as that accumulates, so we age. Another theory is that the telomeres, which are protein segments that end our um, inside our chromosomes, well, at the ends of our chromosomes, that they gradually shorten. And this is why, why uh, we die when we do. But then we ask, why do they shorten? So science doesn't really know. It's interesting to see that there are a lot of animals in the world that live to much greater ages. Turtles are known to live over 177 years. Um, whales, over 200 years. Sharks, nearly 400 years. Um, ocean clams are recorded at over 500 years old. It doesn't seem beyond the bounds of a possibility at all that human beings, not having accumulated 5,000 years of mutations, could live to much greater ages. So how big was the boat? How big was the ark? You see pictures like that one at the top there, on children's books, on the web, on toys. It's a pity really, because this gives the idea that the ark is really small, it's terribly overcrowded, it would be terribly unseaworthy. You can see that ark would collapse and sink in the slightest wind, let alone during a, a, a real storm. No wonder critics scoff. But the ark was actually very big. There are the dimensions that are given in Genesis there. And several full-size replicas of the ark have been built. There's one at Dordrecht in the Netherlands, and there's another at Ark Encounter, Kentucky in the USA. Now, the one in Kentucky can hold 10,000 visitors at a time. 10,000 people can be onboarded at a time. There was a group in Japanese, Japan, and they made models of the Ark. And they were able to show that the dimensions, as given in Genesis, are close to ideal for a structure to survive in water. A group at the University of Leicester here in the UK, also made a study of the ark, and they showed that it would be perfectly buoyant and that it could contain up to 2.1 million sheep. 2.1 million sheep could be accommodated on that ark. So what kind of animals were on the ark? According to Genesis, 
clean and unclean animals, birds, and creatures that move along the ground. And they came to Noah. So there'd be mammals, reptiles, birds on the ark, but they wouldn't be fish or sea creatures or plants. You see cartoons on the web of huge tanks containing whales and sharks with Noah and his family trying to feed them on the ark. Not at all true to life. No fish or sea creatures needed to be on the ark. It mentions in Genesis that it was kinds of animals that got on board the ark. Now, kind includes uh, all varieties, all species that can interbreed with one another. So, for example, the dog kind includes dogs, but it also includes wolves and foxes. There was an experiment he carried out in Berlin not so long ago in which a poodle and a wolf were, uh, were bred together and they produced perfectly viable cubs. Interesting, I wonder what the cubs from a wolf and a poodle are called. I guess they may be called woodles or something like that. I don't know, send suggestions in. Then the pigeon kind includes literally hundreds of varieties, species of pigeon. Noah, Noah didn't have to gather the animals, they came to him. Aspects of the flood, as re recorded in Genesis, show God's intervention. So how many animals would there be on the ark? Now here are the sizes of the various classes, the various taxa of animals on earth. There are up to 8 million species. It's not exactly known how many there are. They keep discovering new ones, but up to about 8 million species. But many of these are capable of interbreeding with one another. Now, the next taxa up is the genus, and there are about 16,000 of those. Even within that taxa, it's still possible for some interbreeding to take place between some of them. And then above that are the families, and there are about 3,000 families. So the genesis kind comes somewhere between genus and family. But for the sake of argument, we'll assume that there were 16,000 animals, birds, and reptile kinds on the ark. It will be an overestimate, but we'll, we'll ride with that. Would there be dinosaurs on the ark? Again, the web is flooded, if I can use that word, with cartoons showing Tyrannosaurus rexes rampaging around the ark and eating all the people and smashing the place to pieces. They love that one. But yes, there certainly would be dinosaurs on the ark. Remember, dinosaurs are reptiles. They hatch out of eggs. They're very small when they hatch out of eggs. The largest known dinosaur egg is smaller than a rugby football. Think of crocodiles, they're another kind of reptile. When a crocodile hatches out, it's only a few inches in size, and yet it grows steadily during its lifetime till it can be 15 or 20 foot long. The huge reptilian dinosaurs whose bones have been found are ones that have been living a long time. It wasn't necessary to take these huge ones onto the ark, they'd have young ones on the ark. And there'd be a good reason to have young ones on the ark because they had to interbreed and replenish the earth after the flood. And the young ones would have the longest time in which to, which to accomplish this. So of the 16,000 um, animal kinds on the ark, 80 of these, we'll assume, were dinosaurs, 80 gen genera of dinosaurs on the ark. Would there be room on the ark? What about food and water and animal waste? Dr. Woodmorap made a careful analysis of this, and uh, he assumed pen sizes about the same as on a modern farm for the bigger animals, <clears throat> and cage sizes for the smaller animals, the same as in a lab for, for rats and, and, uh, and rabbits. And he found that only about half the floor space of the ark would be taken up by the 16,000 animals. So there'd be plenty of room for food, fodder, and water. Well, as for the animal waste and dung, 
it probably fell through slatted floors, a little bit of design, and they could have had slatted floors to take that out of the immediate way. Now, certainly inside the ark, it would be dark, it would be noisy, and it would smell tremendously like a farmyard. But remember, in those days, people weren't so squeamish as us. Uh, they didn't have underarm gels in those days. They had, didn't have deodorants. They were used to living with their animals. In fact, it's only a century or two since most people, apart from the aristocracy, lived with their animals. So the conditions would be perfectly livable, although not, not that pleasant, but perfectly livable. Could eight persons care for 16,000 animals? Well, probably uh, many of the animals were dormant or hibernating on the ark. Creatures are capable of doing that, particularly in adverse circumstances. And then in a modern lab, one person can care for nearly 5,000 mice or rats, and one person on a modern farm can care for 3,800 pigs. So Noah and his family would be busy, but it shouldn't be a problem with a properly designed ark. So what would the flood be like? Well, there'd be stupendous volcanoes, earthquakes, continent-sized tsunamis, turbidity currents, that's underwater mud flow, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes of worldwide extent. First sediment would be deposited on land, then erosion on a vast scale, and an ice age would follow. Evidence for the flood uh, in geology is very extensive. I'm not going to say any more about it here because Dr. Oskarsson tomorrow will be dealing with this topic. And if you possibly can, please tune in and hear what he has to say about it. On the internet, there's um, a site and it says 10 questions creationists can't honestly answer. And number one on the list is the Genesis flood. Where did all that water come from and where did it go? Well, part of it came from clouds in the sky and much from underground. Almost all rocks contain huge quantities of water. The minerals in rocks have water of crystallization and there's much occluded water as well. Volcanoes today, most of what they spew out, about 90% of it is water. Where did the water go? Well, it's right here still with us. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. The deep ocean trenches are much deeper than Mount Everest is high. If the surface were leveled, oceans would cover the Earth to a depth of more than a mile. So this is just typical of the straw men that you see on the, uh, on the web. Did dinosaurs then live alongside humans? If they were on the ark, surely they would have survived the flood, and we should see remnants of them today. In fact, there's quite a lot of evidence that this may be so. There are pictures, depictions, models of dinosaurs from all around the world. On the left there, my left anyway, you see pre prehistoric clay and terracotta figurines from Acambaro in Mexico. They're dated about 800 BC, and they look remarkably like dinosaurs. This petroglyph on the right from National Bridges, sorry, Natural Bridges National Monument in the USA, looks very much like um, a brontosaurus or a, or a dinosaur of that kind. There are lots of these depictions dating from long, long before modern Western scientists discovered dinosaur fossils and named them dinosaurs. Look at that Nile mosaic of Palestrina. The date for that isn't very well known. It's thought it might come from Roman times. It seems to be a group of hunters and they have something very like a dinosaur that they've cornered. Then there's this cylinder seal from Uruk in Mesopotamia. Again, the creatures on there look very much like dinosaurs, Diplodocus type dinosaurs. There's this stegosaur carving from a temple in Cambodia. This same picture actually appears on the Smithsonian website in America. That's pretty much the heartland of evolution in America. 
And uh, there, they say it might be a rhinoceros or it might be a hippopotamus. Now, if you look at that depiction, you can see it has sort of geometrical armored plates running over its back. I never saw a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros with that kind of armor plate on its back. Then look at the tail. That creature has a big tail, whereas both rhinos and hippos have very small tails. It looks much, much more like a stegosaurus of some kind than it does any of those creatures. So there's quite a lot of evidence that dinosaurs did live, did survive the flood, at least for a short while. In 2005, Professor Mary Schweitzer was digging dinosaur bones in Montana, and she dug up a dinosaur fossil, and to her amazement, um, when she cut it open, she found that it still contained soft tissues. She reported this in top science journals. You can see the references on the bottom of the slide there. <clears throat> she found fibrous matrix, transparent, flexible vessels, and preserved microstructures. She even found um, red blood cells there. These are, this is stretchy material. There is actual meat on those dinosaur bones. Not enough meat to make uh, a hamburger, maybe. It'd have to be a dino burger, I guess, but there's not enough for that. But there definitely is protein there. More recently, she's even found evidence that there may be traces of DNA also in um, these dinosaur fossils. Very good evidence that the dinosaurs lived not 68 million years ago, but comparatively recently. Now, I want to change tack for a few minutes and talk about chronology. Chronology is terribly important to both science and religion. It's the backbone of history. Christianity is rooted in history. Timing, clocks, timing devices, supremely important in physics, chemistry, particularly in evolution. Special general relativity, all about time. Somebody once asked Albert Einstein to explain relativity, and he said, if you sit next to a beautiful girl for an hour, it seems like a minute. If you sit on a hot cinder for a minute, it seems like an hour. That's relativity. And, you know, your chronology does depend on your perceptions. It de and it depends particularly on the timing devices that you select. Deep timers rely on very slow ticking radiometric clocks and they ignore other timing devices. Now, I want to spend just a minute or two talking about one particular radiocarbon dating method. Uh, sorry, that's radiocarbon. It's a little bit different from the other radiometric methods. Now, in the radiocarbon method, cosmic rays from the outer space and from the sun reach the Earth's atmosphere. Nitrogen is the main component of the atmosphere, and they convert nitrogen into radioactive carbon-14. The carbon-14 reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere, and that produces labeled, radioactively labeled carbon dioxide. Then plants, during photosynthesis, take up this radioactive carbon dioxide. Then we eat the plants, cattle eat the plants, animals eat the plants. And although the radioactivity is decaying, we keep eating the plants. So there's a constant amount of carbon-14 in our bodies. It reaches an e a constant equilibrium value. But when we die, maybe we're fossilized, then we're not taking any more carbon dioxide in. We're not eating any more plants. And so the radiocarbon in our bodies dies away gradually dissipates, gradually dies down. Here's a curve showing how it dies away. The half-life of carbon-14, that's radiocarbon, is only 5,730 years. So if the fossil originally contained 10 grams 
of radiocarbon, then after 5,730 years, that would have decayed away to five grams. After another 5,730 years, there'd only be 2.5 grams. And after 10 half-lives, 57,300 years, there'd only be 0.01 grams left. So we know how much radiocarbon there was in the fossil to start with. It's the same as the amount in the biosphere. That's the assumption. We can measure how much radiocarbon there is in the fossil now when we dig it up. And then we can use this well-known exponential decay curve to determine the date, the age of the fossil. So the carbon-14 level in the biosphere is known, roughly. And then we measure with very sophisticated and synthesis sensitive equipment called accelerator mass spectrometry, the amount of carbon-14 that's left. These instruments are sensitive enough to detect carbon-14 radiocarbon back in fossils that are up to about 90,000 years old, 90,000 years before the present old. Beyond that date, the level of radiocarbon is too small to be measured. So rocks that are older than 90,000 years or thereabouts should have no detectable carbon-14 in them. So if deep time is correct, then most of the geologic column should have no radiocarbon, shouldn't show any carbon-14, because almost most of the geologic column is older than 90,000 years. So none should be detectable in fossils that are older than 90,000 years. Now, one of the amazing discoveries of recent times is that fossils from essentially every portion of the geologic column do contain measurable amounts of carbon-14. So coal from um, the Eocene, reputedly 45 million years old, has carbon-14, which translates to 50,000 years old. Coal from the Cretaceous, reputedly 80 million years old, has carbon-14 going to an age of 51,000 years. Even Pennsylvanian coal, supposedly 310 million years old, has a carbon-14 age of 49,000 years. Now, at first, a scientist said, well, of course, this must be modern contamination. A huge effort went into finding the source of this contamination. A vast number of experiments were carried out. But it isn't the modern, it isn't contamination of equipment, it isn't modern contamination, and it isn't contamination that's introduced during the analysis measurements. This is real, it's not going away, and it permeates the geologic column. Even dinosaur fossils contain carbon-14. A triceratops from Montana, dated at 31,000 years. A hadrosaur, 38,000 years. An allosaurus, 36,000. An apatosaur, 38,000. Even pre-Cambrian rocks, supposedly a billion and a half years old, had measurable carbon-14 in them. And diamonds from the mantle also had measurable carbon-14 in them. Now, of course, um, those reported ages, carbon-14 ages there, those conventional carbon-14 dates, they're still quite a lot older than about the 5,000 years that we got from tree dating or from the bristlecone pines or from scripture. Could there be a reason for that? It reminds me of the story of the chicken and the farmer. This chicken lived in a farmyard and every day uh, grains and seeds appeared in the, um, in the yard. The chicken said to its friend, don't be ridiculous, there is no farmer. 
these seeds and these grains appear here every day. It's a natural phenomenon. They're here today. They'll always be here. By induction, we know they'll always be here. There is no farmer. And one day, the farmer appeared and he wrung the chicken's neck. It would have been helpful to the chicken if he could have um, taken a more enlightened view of induction. Now, the farmer, every day, seeds and grains grew in his fields and plants, um, I should say fruits, grew in his orchard. He said to his neighbor, Mr. Noah, don't be ridiculous. There is no God. These are natural phenomena. Every year, the seeds and the grains grow. Every year, the fruits grow in my orchard. It's a natural phenomenon, and by induction, they always will. And one day, a huge flood came and swept the farmer away. It would have been helpful to the farmer if he could have had a more enlightened view of induction. Now, we need to take a more enlightened view of induction and the flood as well in assessing carbon-14 dating. Remember the flood. Before the flood, the biosphere was hugely larger than it is today. Vast amounts of biomass were buried in the coal deposits that are found everywhere around the world. More huge amounts of biomass were buried in the oil and gas deposits that are everywhere around the world. Then there are carbonate rocks. Again, massive amounts of uh, biological material were buried as carbonate rocks, like the chalk that we find at Dover. Estimates say that the biosphere before the flood was somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the size that it is today. Now, if the biosphere was, say, 500 times as dilute today, we'll take a, a rough average of the two values, then the carbon-14 level in the atmosphere would have been 1 500th what it is today. And that has to be factored into our calculation of the carbon-14 age. We can't assume that the carbon-14 level is the same as it is today, before the flood. It would have been 1 500th or thereabouts of what it is today. Now, taking that estimate, one five hundredth of um, the level that it is today, it's possible to develop a flood model, a calibration curve, to enable us to, to take carbon-14 data and convert it into a flood model age for the world. So the blue graph there you see is the flood model carbon-14 age, and it's been just been corrected for the extent of carbon-14 before the flood. The green line that you see there, that's the conventional carbon-14 date. So the horizontal axis shows the conventional carbon-14 ages, and the vertical axis is the flood model. Notice that until about 3,000 years before the present, the flood model and conventional carbon-14 agree. They run along the same line. And that's why carbon-14 dating works very well up to about 3,000 years ago. But for older material than that, for fossils and, and specimens from before about 3,000 years before the present, the conventional dates are, are get steadily older than the flood model dates. Notice that. So the flood model gives younger dates. The conventional gives older dates. This gives us a wonderful way of checking to see if the flood model is correct, to see if the flood model or the conventional carbon-14 are the correct ones. Before we look at that, here are carbon-14 dating with that flood model. Now, these are the same figures that I showed you a few minutes ago. The conventional carbon-14 ages are shown in the middle column there. And then the flood model age, after correction, notice they come out at about 5,000 for coal. Even the Pennsylvanian 
again, about 5,000 years before the present. The dinosaurs, 4,800, 4,800 or so. Precambrian rocks, 5,200. So those all agree quite well with the uh, bristlecone pine dating and um, with the accounts of the flood in Genesis and in the other folklore. The fact that the flood model gives ages that are much lower than the conventional carbon-14 model enables us to do a check. It's rather well known that archaeologists and historians are very dissatisfied with carbon-14 dating for dates from the Early Bronze Age and the Stone Age. I've put up a set of quotes here from um, various archaeologists and historians. They're all expressing the fact that they, their dates, which they've derived from careful, careful study of pottery, of stratigraphy, of um, king lists, of all sorts of artifacts, and from astronomical observations of eclipses and so on, they're very dissatisfied with the fact that these dates always seem to turn out to be much lower than carbon-14 dates for these eras. I won't take time to read these all because time's rushing on. But they're all saying that the carbon-14 dates are too old and give rise to these empty centuries when there's nothing of any archaeological remains to, uh, to fill these centuries. There's a huge controversy going on in the literature about this, and you can find it on the web. So that's one point in favour of the compact time and the flood model. Now, it's possible to get a more quantitative estimate by making the, putting the data onto a graph. So I put here the conventional carbon-14 age along the bottom there, and then the historical dates arrived at by archaeologists and historians on the vertical axis. So if historical dates agreed with conventional carbon-14, they would fall on that dotted black line. But if they agreed with the flood model, they would fall on that purple curved line that's curving up towards 5,000 um, uh, 5, uh, years ago. So what does it actually look like? Well, here's um, a set of points taken from the open literature. You can see they do indeed curve well away from the conventional carbon-14 uh, data. They agree much better with the flood model. The agreement isn't perfect, but there are many reasons why it wouldn't be perfect. Don't have time to explain those now. But that's quite impressive evidence that the flood model is almost in the right, in the right area and that conventional carbon-14 dating is way off for these early periods. Is there other evidence that compact time is right? Well, I've already mentioned the soft tissues and the blood cells that Professor Schweitzer are found in, in dinosaur fossils. There have been many other reports of soft tissues from dinosaur fossils. I'll just show you a few. Here's an amazingly preserved dinosaur from the Cretaceous in China. That's 100 to 145 million years, according to conventional dating. The bones are still articulated. The skin is preserved. It's a compressed film. There's pigmentation, organic matter, particularly melanin. Um, microscopy showed impressions similar to melanosomes. Mark Armitage, a microscopist, a microscopist originally from um, California State University. He was a keen collector of fossils. That was his hobby. And he found this brow horn of a triceratops from Hell Creek in Montana. It was unpetrified and it was full of soft tissue. There's his beautiful 
electron microscope photograph of actual bone cells, osteocytes, that were in this triceratops horn. He published his material in a, a reputable science journal. There was nothing in his article about religion or the flood. It was just a straightforward account of the discovery and uh, the, the findings there. When it appeared in the literature, a lead professor ran into his office shouting, we're not going to tolerate your religion at this university. Shortly thereafter, he was sacked from the university. This is typical of um, the censure and uh, censoring that goes on of uh, proponents of the compact time. I'm glad to say that he sued the university and received substantial financial contribution at a later, at a later time. Dr. Leonard Brand was co-discoverer of this whale fossil here from Miocene. There was, it was a baleen type whale and there was a slab of baleen actually lying on one of the flippers. You can see the red area there is a microscopic close-up of the protein material that was still preserved in this whale skeleton. And there's an electron microscope showing the alternating layers of protein fiber. Here's a, an amazing Jurassic fossil, supposedly 150 million years old. It was found by Dr. Phil Wilby at a dig in North Wiltshire, and it contained a perfectly preserved squid ink sac. There it is on the left. Just look at the amazing preservation of that. The ink from inside the sac was uh, resolvated, and an artist drew a picture of the squid with its own ink. It's an incredibly tall order to believe that such delicate biological things could survive for 150 million years. Makes good sense if the fossil is only about 5,000 years old. Then there are the Lazarus bacteria, bacteria found in the rock salt from the Salado Formation in New Mexico. DNA was intact after 250 million years. When the bacteria were put into um, a medium, a growth medium, they returned to life supposedly after 250 million years. Then proteins have been discovered from fossils in Cambrian strata, from a sea scorpion, from a fossil scorpion, protein material, and even sponges, which are supposed to be the earliest branching animals, dating from the Precambrian. Protein materials have also been discovered there from 505, supposedly million years before the present. So from every level in the geological column, these soft tissues are found in fossils. Of course, this is well known, but uh, paleontologists simply say, well, we know these fossils must be hundreds of million years old. We know their age. So DNA and proteins must degrade much more slowly than we had formerly realized. Now, I'm speaking personally as a scientist whose profession is chemistry. And I know that tissues, proteins and DNA degrade very rapidly. They degrade by the action of microorganisms, by hydrolysis, by oxidation. These are all fast processes on the geological timescale. In the lab, tissues, soft tissues, proteins, lipids, sugars, DNA, they have to be carefully preserved in freezers. They have to be kept in the dark, protected from oxygen. It's a huge problem. We use chemical stabilizers, antioxidants, other, in, other preservatives. If anybody can discover a way of preserving these things for decades, let alone hundreds of years, they can make a huge fortune. Living organisms continuously make suites of special antioxidants and enzymes, but these are all used up very quickly at death. Chemically, the survival of DNA and proteins over millions of years just isn't credible. 
And there's some actual evidence of this from measurements of DNA degradation. DNA in papyrus samples, for example, degraded with a half-life of about 250 years. And in moa bones, that's um, an extinct kind of ostrich, the half-life in this medium could have been as long as 5,200 years. So survival of DNA traces for a few thousand years is plausible, not for millions of years. In Pharaoh Tutankhamun's mummy, that's from 1330 BC, minute traces of DNA were detected. So these are very favorable conditions for preservation. And they used the super powerful polymerase chain reaction to detect just these minute quantities. So if only these tiny amounts could be detected under the best circumstances, it's evidence that it's impossible for DNA to survive millions of years. A few thousand years, yes, millions of years, no. So evidence of preserved soft tissues and proteins from, the out, from throughout the geological column even the deepest level, supposedly 500 million years old. That matches the finding of carbon-14, radiocarbon, in fossils and specimens also throughout the whole geologic column. These findings reinforce one another and there's strong evidence favoring compact time. They favor the deposition of much of the geologic column during a recent global flood. So here's a picture comparing deep time and compact time. So the present, that's the Holocene, Pleistocene, part of the Pliocene, that transfers over into the recent, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, and uh, the Stone Age, and the Ice Age. Then most of the rest of the column all transfers into the time of the flood. Not just one year, because the geological consequences of the flood would go on for hundreds of hundreds of years after the waters had receded, but certainly into a short period of time. The Precambrian, supposedly billions of years, with deep time, we don't know exactly how long that is. The Genesis account suggests only about 1,000 or 1,500 years. Carbon-14 has been discovered in Precambrian samples, but it's very minute quantities. But the very fact that there is carbon-14 there with a half-life of only 5,000 years suggests that the Precambrian should really only be thousands of years long. I'm coming to an end now, and I, I have a question for you. Who do you trust? Do you trust politicians? Not many people would say yes to that question. Do you trust your bank? Not many people trust their bank nowadays either. Do you trust your doctor nowadays? Well, I have a very nice doctor, but still, if it's something serious, I would like uh, a, sec a second opinion. Do you trust Wikipedia? Well, you know, when it comes to questions of religion, Wikipedia definitely can't be trusted. When it comes to philosophy, when it comes to lifestyle, Wikipedia definitely can't be trusted. We live in an age of fake news, fake ideas, fake this, junk food, and so on. If we don't trust these things, we don't trust the BBC, we don't trust the media, why would we trust scientists? particularly scientists from the softest of soft sciences, evolutionary biology. There's no need for us to be carried along with this deep time. It's perfectly reasonable and it's perfectly rational to um, reject deep, deep time in favor of compact time. Now you should also be asking yourself, do I trust Professor Walton, what do I know about him? Well, I'm a member of a conservative church, the Adventist church, but I'm not employed by them. I don't receive any money from them. In fact, I pay them quite a bit of money. 
I'm not getting paid for this lecture. I wouldn't expect to be paid for this lecture. I don't make any money from being a creationist. I don't get any prestige from being a creationist. It's not popular being a creationist. If I believed that deep time was correct, I could easily join a mainline church that believes in theistic evolution and deep time. But I don't. It's not popular being a creationist. So those are some reasons why it's worthwhile listening to what I have to say. So what's my take home message for today? The global flood was a real historical event. It happened just over 5,000 years ago. And it indicates that compact time is the measure of life on Earth. Evidence in favor of this comes from radiocarbon dating when it's rightly understood and corrected for the flood. Then the soft tissues in fossils throughout the geological column are more evidence confirming this. And the archaeohistorical dating also confirms this. You know, those are particularly impressive bits of evidence because they are timing devices, they're chronological methods that are independent of one another. One of them is a radiometric method. One of them relies on the well-known rapid degradation of soft tissues in fossils. And one of them is the archaeo, the historical dating, painstakingly arrived at and confirmed in numerous ways. All three of these, independently agree with compact time. It's very impressive evidence in in indeed. Accepting this, we can see that the Genesis accounts of history are reliable. We can rely on what we read in Genesis about the origins of humankind. We can have confidence that scripture is rationable and is rationable and reasonable. So you have to make up your own mind now. Do you come from Eden or are you from the apes? Goodbye and I hope to see you tomorrow where there'll be more evidence favoring deep time from a geological perspective with Dr. Oskerson. Goodbye from